I have lost track of how many Sundays we have not been together to worship. I've lost track of how long we have been apart, other than those who are able to make it to the parking lot most sunny Sunday mornings. And it's interesting to be back in here because I see we have palms from Palm Sunday. My stole from Lent is still in here because we have not been together since the beginning of the season of Lent. This is getting old. I'm sure you feel that way about the way things are with schools and work and shopping and wearing masks, which is becoming, unfortunately, second nature for us. And as I resisted for so long saying this is a new normal because this will pass, I'm still holding on to that because I know that one day this will be over. We'll probably do things in a different way than we've done them before. It's going to be a long time before we have a potluck dinner or we're able to shake hands, probably even longer before we feel comfortable hugging one another again. But one day this will be in the past. But for right now, if you feel like sitting down and crying, if you feel like screaming, cussing, kicking, not the dog or your spouse or your children, but just having yourself a little hissy fit, that is okay, you're in good company. Toby read from the Lamentations this morning, a book of scripture from the Hebrew Bible that is a remembrance of times past, the return to Jerusalem when Jerusalem was destroyed, remembering the exile, remembering the pain, remembering the agony, and the chapters, just five chapters, all sort of reach an arc with chapter three, because it begins with a grieving widow. That's the image that we see, and then goes through the passage that we read about the suffering one. And look at the words that we read. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So many times, I think as Christians especially, we have been conditioned not to, not to let our feelings out, to pretend that everything is okay, to put on a happy face and smile and nod and say everything is good. Just as we tend to say when someone is facing the death of a loved one, he is in a better place or she is in a better place, as if that's going to make everything better. But God understands human emotions and understands human grief, which is why the lamentations the sad songs, the songs of rebellion and crying out and saying, how long, O God, are included in Holy Scripture. And I've often told people when they've said to me, my soul feels so downcast, my heart is broken, I don't know what happiness is, to quote the lamentation we just read, but we put it in different words today, don't we? But people have said to me, I don't even know how to pray anymore, and I will say to them, read the Psalms, read them out loud cry them out loud, and if that doesn't work for you, open to the book of Lamentations. Because there is a thread through this that we need to remember. And the song that we sang this morning to begin our service, Great is Thy Faithfulness, comes directly from this passage. I will remember what God has done for me. I will remember that his mercies are new every morning and his faithfulness is great. Those are the words we need to hear, the words that help us to hold on to hope. Even though Lamentations doesn't quite end on a happy note, we go through the fifth chapter, and the question is there, God, will you forsake us forever? It's all right to question. It's all right to express anger. It's all right to express frustration, as long as we don't let it turn into bitterness and we remember that God's mercies are new every morning. Jesus is talking about something new in the passage that we read from Mark. Mark's gospel begins chapter 1. This is the beginning of the good news of God in Jesus Christ with his baptism. We're used to those stories, the early stories of his call of the disciples. We love to hear that, well, I will make you fishers of men, because he's calling the fishermen, the salt of the earth, these noble men without much education, but good, loving Jewish men, strong men. But then he turns around and does something so ridiculous that they can't even see straight. He calls a tax collector. Everyone knows a tax collector is a sinner. Fishermen are sinners too, but their sins are more private and not necessarily related to the job they do. But a tax collector is colluding with Rome. He's collecting this dirty foreign money that has images of the God called Caesar on it, breaking commandments. And he's hated and despised. And so he uses his position to cheat people. I'm sure even the fishermen were astounded when they had gathered around Jesus, feeling like the underdogs that had been raised up and lifted up to follow this man that they saw was from God. 
only to have him turn around and call a wretched, miserable tax collector, one who had probably collected taxes from them since it was in the same location. And what does Jesus do when this tax collector is called and his life is changed and the feelings of, of acceptance are bubbling up in him and new life and new hope? He has a party and he invites his friends. Well, people don't like a good party in the name of Jesus, do they, sometimes? And they start to question him. They start to question his disciples. They look at John, who is one that they had hoped might be the Messiah. John, the cousin of Jesus. John, who was baptizing in the wilderness, calling people to repentance and new life. But John even recognizes Jesus and says, Behold, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But they say John's disciples fast, which was their tradition. Not the law, but the tradition. The Pharisees fast which is not, again, the law, but the tradition. And yet yours are here. What they're really saying is you're not just feasting instead of fasting. You're feasting with low lives, Lord. What are you doing with these no good tax collectors and their friends and these sinners? Jesus says something that they can't understand, but something that made their blood boil. He said, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is present? The church later on in scripture will be referred to as the bride of Christ looking back to this moment. Jesus himself is the bridegroom, and he is going to do something new. And he tells them two parables that probably don't make a lot of sense to us, one more than the other. The one about you don't take a new piece of cloth that hasn't been shrunk, that hasn't been worn, and use it to patch an old garment, because when you wash it, that other one will shrink and pull away. The tear will be worse, and the new fabric will be ruined as well as the old. And the one about you don't put new wine into wineskins that are old. Wineskins. Now, if you picture wineskin in your mind as something that you can order on Amazon, which is sort of a, a roundish shaped thing with a spout on it and maybe a cord to put it around your neck as you hike in the woods if you need some wine in the woods or something like that, I don't know. But a wineskin was literally the skin of an animal. And they would fill it from the place where they crushed the grapes and the, it would be poured in, and as it fermented and the gases came off, it would expand and expand and expand. You can look these things up online and see what a real wineskin looks like. It looks like the form of an animal. But as the wine is emptied out, it gets hard, it gets brittle, it shrinks down again. And if you put more wine in, because it's lost its ability to be flexible, it will burst and the wine will be lost. Jesus is telling us that God is always going to do something new. Grace now is not dependent on adherence to law. Grace is dependent on the presence of God and the power of God in our lives to redeem and to renew and to make whole. This is something they don't want to hear because they've gotten really good at following the law. The Pharisees are experts in the law. They can quote it at anyone at any time to show their sinfulness, the sinfulness of the ones they're looking upon, like these tax collectors. And Jesus, if he is with them, must be like them, don't you think? But Jesus says God's going to do something new. So here we are. I've encouraged you to go ahead and lament if you need to, but I'm also encouraging you to look at the newness of life that God gives us in Jesus Christ. Because God is doing new things, we're doing all sorts of new things here at the church. We're worshiping in different ways. We're online. But that makes us able to reach people so far away we don't even know who's with us. We have former members of Epworth around the country who are with us. We may have people from around the world with us. We just finished a virtual Bible school where the kids and their parents and their grandparents and those who were caring for them got together and did things in a new way. And it's working for us. And there's a feeling in the country now that people are looking for answers. More folks who call themselves atheists and agnostics are beginning to tune into worship, thinking maybe it's time to reach beyond us to something bigger, something more fulfilling. And even in our agony as we cry out, God, where are you? Just as our Lord Jesus Christ did from the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It begins with a cry of anguish and despair, but it ends with remembering God's mighty deeds to us. Great is your faithfulness. I hope you will take some time today to stop. And the sun is coming out here now, but the pavement was wet enough that it wasn't safe to take all the equipment outside. But as the sun comes out, I hope you will look for the rainbow in the sky. 
Rainbows, the sign of God's covenant faithfulness to us and the promise, are always more visible against a dark sky than they are against the light. So if you find yourself despairing, get out the book of Lamentations, cry out to God, but trust that God, who is our hope, will be with you. I encourage you, if you live with someone else, to take some time today to say, where have I seen God's new mercies on this day? Where have I felt God's presence powerfully speaking in my life on this day, at this moment? If you live by yourself as I do, it gets a little lonely sometimes, and the feelings of isolation are very threatening sometimes. Call up a friend, or sit down with a pen and paper, or at your computer and journal your feelings of God. Write your own psalm, write your own lament, remember to claim the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. I don't know yet what new thing God is going to do with us here, but God is always new and always faithful, always just, always merciful, always filled with grace. I love the story of Jesus calling a tax collector and raising him to new life because when Christ comes to each of us, I hope it is at a place in our lives where we can recognize our own sinfulness and say, I am not worthy of this great gift that you're giving me, because that's when we understand that grace is nothing that we earn, nothing that we could ever expect as what is due us, but it is the free gift of a loving God who has the power to redeem even this pandemic. I'm sure there were times when Jesus was faced with those who questioned him, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the doubters, the naysayers, those who turned against him, even his own disciples when they deserted him. I'm sure he had feelings in whatever way it was expressed then of this is getting old. And still, his love for us reached across our brokenness and the brokenness of the world to find healing and hope and redemption. One day, this will be behind us. One day, this will end. But until that time, until the time Christ comes, we live in between times. But great is God's faithfulness to us. If we love one another and remind each other that the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ, we will come through this together in his power, and we will do new things to his honor and his glory through the power of his Holy Spirit and the power of his presence in our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen.